a bit more like it. Nobody likes to walk onto a silent stage. So good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Diehards, true believers, fame lab, faithful, and all newcomers to our communication congregation. You are all most welcome to this first of three fame lab international tremi finals. So I am Quentin Cooper, tweeting as at QWERTY, and I will be here for the foreseeable future, most of the day. And now, before I begin to get going on this, come on, come in. You've not missed much uh, of this epic eight-hour journey. Uh, who here at this ungodly hour has been here, walked this way before, or has, at least has a general idea what's in store? Stick your hands up. OK, great, great to have you back. And just out of curiosity, how many of you are planning to be here for this whole epic journey, matching me step for step? Whoa, I admire that ambition. You can have too much of a good thing. Uh, I will check at the start of Tremi Final 3 to see how many of you have made good on that pledge. And who amongst you here is a novice, a rookie, a greenhorn, uh, someone lured here either by the love of science, a desire for free things, or an enforcement from some sort of teacher? Ah, right, okay. I thought that might be that little posse over there in the corner. Great, okay. So, I should probably explain a little bit about what this is all about then. You are in for a treat, or more accurately, 10 diverse, diverting treats, 10 international Fame Lab winners representing 11 countries. Uh, each of them has to deliver a stimulating, scintillating sliver of science three minutes maximum. That's all it is, three minutes. If they go even slightly over three minutes, they hear this, which is pretty hard to ignore, let's be honest as well. Uh, then they face a couple of minutes of questions from our judges. That is essentially it. There are a couple of other bits. Uh, no PowerPoint or other electronic aids, no props other than that which you can carry on yourselves, and no live animals larger than a llama. The rest you will pick up as we go along. Suffice to say, what you have stumbled on is the world's largest science communication competition. <laughs> tens of thousands have taken part since it began 10 years ago. Uh, tens of millions have watched TV and online coverage. NASA and CERN have staged their own versions. And this year, like any other year, many hundreds of entrants have battled through heats and local uh, semi-finals and finals to get here and earn their place as their country's champion. So it's a big thing. But 31 winners is rather too many to squeeze into just one international final. Try to watch Eurovision if you need convincing. So you are at the first of three Tremi finals, 10 in this one. So very simply, our three judges have the task of choosing three out of 10, that's 30% maths fans, to go through to tomorrow's final. So tomorrow, you get to vote in the UK general election, those of you who are registered. But in the Fame Lab International Funnel, you also get to vote. But you'll be delighted to know, for today, you can relax. There's no audience vote. It's just down to our three judges. So it is about time we met them. Can you please welcome scientist, science communicator, salsa teacher, and organizer of Glasgow Fame Lab, Jamie Gallagher. From the South African Agency for Science and Technology Advancement, our partners in FameLab South Africa, the winner of which is cunningly not in this Trebi final, we've Joanne Riley. <laughs> and Professor of Human Brain Research in the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, multidisciplinary collaborator par excellence, and believer that we need to educate a healthy disrespect for boundaries, Vin Walsh. So, Jamie, what's this, just before we get started, what's the, what is this science communicator dance thing? Because a mate, mate of mine, Tom Pringle, yeah. better known as Dr. Bunhead, yes. the kind of king yeah. of science shows for the younger audiences, he's also a master of the tango. So is there something going on here? Well, yeah. At, at first, I was a scientist, and I was a dancer, and those were separate worlds. And then I started realising that a lot of scientists love to dance. Uh, and then I started realising there's a lot of science in dance. And so, like, last night, we fused the worlds. We did a Strictly Come Science thing. We talked about the science of dance, and then we had the audience dancing. Right, and you know there are choreographers out there who are specialist dance choreographers, well, not specialist dance, but specialist science choreographers. And I know yeah. this because I'm married to one. 
Oh. <laughs> She could have been there last night. Um, she, I think she would have been if there wasn't a small child involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's fascinating. Uh, science is now informing the dance practice, and dancers are learning from scientists and the other way around. Genius. And Joanne, I love doing the Fame Lab masterclasses, but I particularly love doing the South African one because it was completely out of control. There were 20 people in it, which is way too many. All of them were wild, crazy, exuberant. I would like if all 20 could have been here with us today as well. But can you just remind us, when we actually get this far, what are the official criteria on which you're meant to be judging the 10 who are actually with us today? So today we're judging on the three Cs. That's content, clarity, and charisma. Uh, content referring to the actual scientific uh, facts um, and scientific soundness of the presentation. Yeah, because it would be bad to get that wrong. Yeah. Saying the Earth yeah. is flat, poor start, yeah. really. <laughs> Climate change isn't caused by human... Oh, no, hang on, that's what Trump... Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. Uh, clarity, then, referring to um, whether we clearly understand what's being said, whether we'll kind of take away a message um, that is clear and uh, we may be able to then tell somebody else about and then charisma being really, you know, the wow, the presentation, the, um, what makes us want to listen uh, to the person. Brilliant, brilliant. And Vin, you have your own theory as to why you've been chosen to be a judge here. I, I, I do, and, and I'm judging purely on charisma. Um, of course. I, 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 I sometimes, people comment on a passing resemblance I might have to Simon Cowell. Uh, as, a, as a judge, <laughs> and, and that kind of upsets me. I, I understand the hair and the cheeks instead of cheekbones, but um, uh, he has moves. Uh, and somebody <laughs> came up to me a, 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 a few weeks ago, and, and she said, oh, you look just like Simon Cowell. So I got all of her hands, and I put them up my jumper, and I said, can you feel a move or a pectoral? <laughs> uh, and it's, it's sometimes the only way I have of distinguishing. And when yeah. does that go to court? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, each of our finalists has three minutes, but then, then they, have, they have two minutes for the questions. So yep. clearly, these are all international winners. Yep. So are those two minutes going to be possibly the key thing to sort between them? Well, the whole five minutes is, is, is the key thing. Uh, and I think what happens, we all get nervous when we give presentations. Even now, there will be a little bit of nerves on the judging panel. And you get that little adrenaline drop when you think it's all over. So I, I think it will be really important that people stay on their game for that two minutes. Uh, yeah, it's not just what you have practiced and you know you're going to say it's it's a little bit about how you are on your feet as well yeah, how comfortable you exactly. are when you get to that yeah. point and, and jamie a lot of these people in fact i think all of them in this first tremi final they are talking not in their first language but in their probably their second in some cases yeah. maybe their third this is not a competition about who speaks the best english so how do you factor that in that some people will be more fluent than others yeah i i, I think as long as everyone relaxes and the message is going to come across, these are all excellent communicators and they are going to get around the language barrier quite easily, I think. They're going to communicate and tell us a story and I think we'll follow along quite easily. And Joanne, finally, all 10 have come here today as national champions. 70% of them are going to leave here as losers. Sorry, but that's, <laughs> that's just the way it goes. Are uh, you no worries about causing a diplomatic incident or anything like that, that the two countries may <laughs> never speak to each other again after today? No, I think, um, I mean, this whole experience is a prize in itself. I mean, everyone that's here are all winners. Yeah, um, exactly. That's the bit. You get to come really, here. Yeah. It's less yeah. exciting for the UK winner because you get a free trip yeah. to Cheltenham. That's less exciting than if you come from, <laughs> say, Australia to get a trip to Cheltenham. But yeah, exactly. This yeah, bit now is the fun bit. And everyone friends. I've never... I've never known anyone leaving Fame Lab with any antagonism toward anyone else. I think Good. Yeah. You took that question very seriously. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, well, try, remember, we try to choose three finalists from, the, it, from ten richly deserving winners is not an easy task. So please, can we give our judges uh, some applause of encouragement? <laughs> and remember, you may not get an audience vote, but you can make a difference by your reactions, your applause, your cheers, your yells, whatever it might be. This is Fame Lab, not Fame Library, so be ready to make some noise, okay? But not too much, it's still only 10 a.m. Uh, okay, so right, I've done a token bit of background, I've half explained the rules, I've given a minimal introduction to the judges. Let us bring on our first sacrificial victim. Uh, it's all chosen randomly, and as chance would have it, the very first of our 31 Tremi finalists is the one representing the current country champion, Malaysia, which kind of means that just like many of our MPs, 
Uh, the 2016 international winner, Abhi Virakumara Sivam, is in his last day in office. And unlike them, they can't, he can't apply to be re-elected. So can Malaysia's 2017 winner, Dr. Zaid Omar, match Abhi's achievement? He's certainly going to try. Uh, Zaid's a senior lecturer at the University of Technology Malaysia, looking into understanding the future through his work on computer vision and artificial intelligence. He's a big movie fan, so he knows his machines have a long way to go to catch up with the ones we see in <coughs> sci-fi films. He's also, in his own words, a long-suffering supporter of Newcastle United. So he's used to failure as well as success. But, but last month, Newcastle were crowned champions uh, of the championship and are going back to the Premier League. So could that be a good Omar omen? Tough going first, so audience crank it up a bit. Go crazier for Malaysia and the magpie mind of Dr. Zaid Omar. <laughs> take this for granted, but how do humans recognize faces? Well, in a way, the brain can be thought of as a very advanced computing machine. The brain receives input data from the eyes, in this case, a person's face. It then detects some important landmarks around the face, for example, skin color, eye color, size of nose and cheekbones. It then tries to match these landmarks to someone already in our brain database, and finally, produce an output. Ah, this face belongs to my daddy my baby daughter would probably say. <sighs> but when you think about it, isn't the reverse also true? Isn't the computer really just a basic version of the brain? And therefore, can we program the computer to perform facial recognition just like humans? Well, yes, we can. In fact, yes, we already did. Facial recognition software was used to track down the persons responsible for the Boston Marathon bombings in 2013. And let's not forget your embarrassing photos on Facebook, courtesy of the photo tagging feature. <laughs> so facial recognition technology is very much part of our lives, but getting there was not easy. You see, the computer can perform basic tasks like multiplying huge numbers far better than humans. But when it comes to learning and intelligence, we are still miles ahead. So what sets us apart? What could be the X factor responsible for creating this intellect among the human race? Well, the answer lies in what is inside the brain. Billions of cells called neurons and the special way they interact among themselves in a network formation. And these neurons are what computer engineers are trying to emulate. This is called the neural network, a computer algorithm that takes inspiration from real neurons in our brain. And this is the real magic behind facial recognition technology. Guys, this is the epitome of super brain computing. Neural network is considered intelligent precisely because it mimics the human brain. A single neuron on its own is pretty basic, but lots and lots of neurons connected together, that allows for more advanced and complex processing to take place and achieve real artificial intelligence. Think of it like this. If I throw a pebble into a pond, it will create plain circular ripples on the water. If I throw two pebbles together, when the ripples collide, a new shape will emerge, a V. Therefore, isn't it also plausible that if I throw a huge amount of pebbles in a specific way into the pond, I can make the ripples create a far more complex shape, like a picture of a house, for example. And that analogy is how computers utilize neural networks to perform facial recognition. These facial landmarks are like the pebbles that are fed into the network where the ripples mix and mingle to finally produce an output. Match, frowned. Face equals Zaid Omar. A neural network is so good, it's on par with even our ability to recognize faces. Neural network is the key to the future of artificial intelligence, and it all begins here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry for the mess. I'll help clean it up afterwards. Uh, thank you, Zaid. I, I have a question. I'm not uh, very familiar with this field. So, how accurate is the facial recognition and what factors influence its accuracy? Right. Um, thank you for the question. There are um, sort of a lot of people doing um, facial recognition using neural networks, and the performances vary, but uh, the best that we have found so far is 97% accuracy, which means that um, out of 100 people, uh, it's, it's trying to uh, sort of detect or recognize, it can sort of correctly um, recognize 97 of them, which is just um, 
0.3% lower than humans. I mean, ourselves, we are not perfect. Um, if we are given 100 people to recognize, we won't get uh, all of them uh, all the time. So that's why I say that neural network is almost on par with uh, human performance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I work with patients who <laughs> have lost the part of the brain that allows them to see faces, so they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between me and you. Okay. Um, and there are, there's even one patient who's a farmer who can't recognize his family but can recognize his sheep. Um, so my question for you is, do you want your neural networks to work in the way that the human brain works, or do you just want it to be very accurate? Because those are two very different things. Google has a great memory, but it doesn't work like my memory. So what do you think is the important goal? Well, um, I sort of tend to disagree a bit, because I think the, the essence of neural network is that it is based, um, it takes inspiration from how our uh, neurons in our brains work. I mean, it's not going to be exactly the same, but um, the way it um, utilizes the nodes and how they are connected and the layers between them, um, it sort of takes inspiration from uh, our brains. And um, so going back to your question, I think if, um, you know, um, it, it, it is going to be a, a, a step forward and a good idea for a neural network to, yes, uh, uh, you know, mimic the, the how our brain works yep. rather than uh, yep. something else. Thank you very much. Okay, remember the face, remember the name for a Hawaii, the lads are Newcastle supporting Superbrain, Dr. Zaid Omar. Thank you. Okay, so if you hadn't figured it out before, now you get the idea. It's three minutes from them to show their stuff, two minutes for our judges to try and knock the stuffings out of them, the striptease part and the throwing of the pebbles, that's optional. And very clever that only one contested in. He's, he's gone first, done well, and trashed the stage for everybody else. Very, very <laughs> clever. Uh, okay, second up, we've uh, Yumna Musa, our first ever winner from some say Qatar, some say Qatar, some say Qatar, some say Gutter. They're all accepted ways of pronouncing Q A T A R. Uh, Yumna is actually Lebanese, uh, no fame lab there yet, but we're always looking to expand. And moved to Qatar, or possibly Qatar, in 2008 where she's a math teacher at a girls' secondary school specializing in algebra and calculus. She says she's taught in the French curriculum, the American curriculum, uh, the Lebanese curriculum, the Qatari curriculum, and the international baccalaureate curriculum. I'm not sure if there is a th such a thing as an international fame lab curriculum, but if there is, I've no doubt Yumna will have calculated what she needs to do to get through to the final. Add together A and B, where A equals your left hand, B equals your right, to welcome our Qatari calculus queen, Yumna Musa. <laughs> People look into the mirror before leaving home. They want to check whether they look nice, beautiful, or maybe attractive. Our attraction to another body's person increases when that body is symmetrical and in proportion. Well, how mathematics is related to that? First, let's look at the Fibonacci sequence, where each number can be found by adding up the two numbers before it, 5 is 3 plus 2, 8 is 5 plus 3, and so on. This sequence can be found everywhere in the nature. One example is when you count the number of petals of different kinds of flowers, most probably you will find a Fibonacci number. Looking at the ratio between two successive terms, like dividing 5 by 3 is 1.6, dividing 21 by, thir uh, by 13 is 1.612. If you keep on dividing two successive terms, you will end up with the number 1.618033, which is the approximation of the, the golden ratio. Why do we need to know about the golden ratio? In most proportional bodies, the height of the whole body divided by the height of the belly button is 1.618. The same in your hand, the distance between the finger and the elbow divided by the distance between the, the wrist and the elbow is the same number in most proportional bodies. So tall people, stop teasing short people. They might have a body which is more proportional than yours. The face is another great example. Dividing the height by the width is 1.618 in most attractive faces. 
The same for the distance between the eyebrows and the lip divided by the length of the nose is the same number in most attractive faces. So ladies, you need to know where to draw your eyebrows. Well, all these golden proportions appear naturally all over our body. But what about horizontal proportions? These can be controlled through diet and exercises. So the aim while exercising should be 1.618. Means for men, the measure of the broad shoulders to the measure of the waist is 1.618. For a woman, it's a bit more tricky, mainly because we look at the measure of the waist with the shoulders and the hips at the same time. So if you have been trying to get a perfect body, how successful could you become if you use a program built scientifically for that purpose? Thank you. So I was wondering, we've thought about the aesthetics that this, this ratio gives us. Are there places where this is an important number in the way we use the number? So, so it found in nature, how do humans use it? Uh, this, uh, this number yeah. or other numbers, you mean? So the, the Fibonacci sequence, the golden ratio, yeah, it's do humans used in use the, it? Yeah, in, in, in the plastic surgeries. Uh, you, you can see the uh, golden mask, the surgeons are using it, even in arts. Uh, in uh, Mona Lisa, you can find uh, in the face, you can find lots of uh, all the dimensions are taken in uh, the golden uh, mean. Uh, even in the pyramids in uh, Egypt, in Giza, uh, they used uh, 4,000 years ago, they used uh, the golden ratio in building these pyramids. Even in, uh, in uh, plants, uh, the, uh, when, uh, when you look at the sunflower, you will find uh, different spirals. Some go left and some move uh, uh, right. Uh, always the number of the left and the, and the right uh, uh, spirals uh, will be uh, 34 and 21. And always the, the ratio of these two numbers will be a golden ratio and many more places in art and uh, architecture, and uh, nee, that's it. And wh why would nature <laughs> employ that? Why do you think it's arisen in nature? Is there Actually, a reason? Actually, it's a divine ratio. Uh, it's, uh, there is no reason why this exists. It's like why this, uh, this uh, universe exists. It's why uh, uh, specific uh, uh, numbers in uh, physics, like uh, the speed of light, why, why is it like that, this much? So there is no, there is no reason for that. It's a divine ratio. I'm afraid our golden ration of time is over. One more time for our utter star from Qatar, Qatar Yumna Musa. I think I'm more of a 1.619 myself, but yeah, it's, it's fine. So two presentations so far, two on faces, rather oddly, partly as well. Now, remember I said at the start, we've got 10 Tremi finalists representing 11 countries. Well, here comes the reason why. Our one Fame Lab winner who is here jointly on behalf of two countries, Estonia and Latvia. They held a dual competition, and the jewel that sparkled brightest, see what I did there, was De Liang Young. Now, as you may have figured out from his name, De Liang is neither Estonian nor Latvian. Good neutral candidate as the winner. He is Chinese-Canadian. After living on four other continents, he ended up in the Estonian capital Tallinn to do a PhD in materials engineering and now works at their brilliantly Alan Partridge-sounding science centre, the AHA Science Centre. Uh, De Liang says his fondness for black clothing and black humour means some people find him amusing, others find him annoying, but the term he prefers is rambunctious. And since it's a great term, I'm going to use it as well. So get ready to have the rambunctious among us and welcome De Liang Young. <laughs> As a science fiction fan growing up, I had my steady diet of these TV shows and movies. And they included Star Trek, Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, Stargate, uh, oh yes, Doctor Who. And, and all these 
series and movies, what they had in common was they featured their own starship. And these starships would take the characters to distant planets and galaxies. So if you were to ask me what I wanted to be when I grow up, hands down, I would still say I wanted to be captain of my own starship. And, well, here's the thing. I wanted to talk about solar sails. So Johannes Kipler, 400 years ago, uh, envisioned, he looked up into the sky, and with his telescope, he envisioned, he saw a comet, and the comet had a tail. And as the comet orbited around the sun, the, comet, the tail of the comet would constantly point away from the sun. So why is that the case? Well, as the comet approaches the sun, the sun heats up the comet. And as it heats up the comet, all the ice on the comet starts to sublimate. And, and then all the dust gets to, uh, gets to form the comet's tail. So hence, he observed that as, as the comet approached the sun, the comet's tail would always point away from the sun, regardless of which direction the comet was actually moving. And Right now, we know that sunlight is composed of photons. And photons have, have energy, and they also have momentum. And with this momentum, you could use it to transfer a force. And this force is called radiation pressure. So back to the topic of my starship. I have a, a starship right here. And the thing is, with most uh, space-faring objects, what we have to do is that we have to attach a rocket to it and blast it into space. <coughs> but the thing is, once you get into space, you still need thrusters to move this ship. And, of course, if I'm using fuel, fuel is finite, it's limited, so I'm not going to get very far. But the thing is, if I use the sun's radiation, then what I could do is, with my starship, I can attach a sail, shine a light, or the sun's, uh, the sun's radiation, and away I go, off to explore the faraway galaxies. Well, it's possible that one day I will become, become captain of a starship. And on that day, I could say that I have seen the galaxy. I have lived my sci-fi dream. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So you want to be a starship captain when yes. you grow up. <laughs> um, that's very admirable. Um, it, it, when we're thinking about this, this sail, have, mm -hmm. have you, uh, are there any calculations about how efficient this sail would be? Is it, is it something ridiculous that it would have to be five miles wide to propel your, your starship? Well, exactly. I mean, if, if this was the size of my starship and I wanted to move it in outer space... It looks more like a boat than a starship. <laughs> I, I, I think Try to use your you imagination. To, your science is great. You need to work on your origami. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> but the sail, the size of the sail would probably be the size of this... Uh, screen. Is that all? It's probably a bit bigger. Right. I mean, how much bigger? I mean, if you're, if you're moving a larger ship, you're talking about yeah. kilometers. So the size would be kilometers big. And you would have to, uh, once you deploy it, uh, you, would point it a, uh, you would point it at the sun or away from the sun as you're moving out. And then as the photons hit, then it would transfer the momentum to the cell and then bring your starship along. And uh, uh, are there any prototypes? Uh, 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 people yes. calculated this on, obviously, Earth-bound objects. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, the, the main prototype now, backed up by NASA, is this Light Ship 2, which is the size of a, a, a loaf of bread. And they would send it off into space. And once it deploys, the, the sails would be about 30, uh, 32 meters square. So it's, a, it's a sizable sail. I mean, it's probably the size of twice the size of the stage. And then once it's deployed, it would be sent off into outer space. And what qualifications have you got for being a spaceship pilot? <laughs> a material scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Admi admirer of Einstein. <laughs> how, if we are flying away from the sun, how far away would we be able to go using just this power? Because I guess you get to a certain point, and there's just not enough photons to carry on driving you forward. So does it have a quite fixed limit? Um, yes, it does. So. Put it into perspective, 
um, if we use a solar sail to get to Mars, it would take us barely to Mars, and the amount of light we get would probably be around 6% by the time we get to the distance of Mars, and then that would be it. And then you're going to have to, but then you, you'll be traveling the rest of the way on its own uh, velocity. And you've now got to travel with your own velocity, our honorary Latvian Estonian <laughs> Starship Captain, Derliang Young. Thank you. And I love the feedback that we had from Simon, I mean Vin there, that, you know, your science is great, you need to work on your origami. You're not going to hear that very often. Now, if you put Estonia and Latvia together and shuffle the words around, you get salivate eat. But there is no time for food now. Got lots more fame labs to suggest. Well, I'll tell you what, I will allow you one tiny snack, one Malteser. It is our Maltese champion of 2017, Anthea Aegeus Anastasi. Uh, after a first-class honours degree in engineering, Anthea is now at the Department of Metallurgy and Materials Engineering at Malta University, doing a PhD in Molecular Simulation and Atomic Probe Studies on Graphene. She's also an assistant lecturer there, and so she's got a multi-dimensional career, even if in graphene she's studying a two-dimensional substance. And she's added one more dimension by entering and winning FameLab, a uh, hexagonal lattice of applause, please, for our 3D triple A rated Maltese champion, Anthea Aegeus Anastasi. <laughs> that when you were just a little toddler, you might have created one of the strongest materials without you even knowing. The first time that you had a pencil in your tiny little hands and scribbled something on a piece of paper, you possibly created a masterpiece. And I'm not talking about the drawing that I'm sure your mother told you how beautiful it was. But I'm talking about the shiny gray material that the pencil left behind on the paper. Would you believe me if I told you that you possibly created a material similar to diamond, but better? Or if I told you that here I hold the same material 300 times stronger than steel, and yet you cannot see it? Let me try to explain this to you. If we take a look at this pencil, or rather the graphite within, we see that it is made up of millions and billions of carbon layers stacked on top of each other. We can compare graphite to this deck of playing cards. When we write with pencil, we would be essentially scattering these layers of carbon all over the paper. Now, just a single one of these carbon layers is one of the strongest materials known to mankind, and it is called graphene. So the recently discovered graphene is a very thin and flexible material. Do you remember when I told you that it was similar to diamond? The only difference is just the way that the same carbon atoms are arranged in their position. In graphene, the atoms are holding hands to other atoms next to them. However, in diamond, the atoms are holding hands to other atoms above and below them. But why is graphene better than diamond? Unlike diamond, graphene is a very good conductor of electricity, much better than copper. But mostly, even though diamonds will make most of girls happy, graphene is possibly the material of the future. While it will never replace diamonds, graphene can revolutionize the world as we know it. How can this be? Holes in graphene can help us filter out salt from seawater to produce fresh, clean drinking water for those 1.2 billion people around the world suffering from the water crisis. Drugs attached to graphene can help us target cancer cells much more efficiently. And graphene is also leading us to the first prototypes of flexible electronics. Now, billions are being invested in graphene research. However, graphene hasn't been around for so long, and that's why these technologies are not in the market yet. However, from now on, do not take the pencil for granted anymore. It holds one of the most promising materials, and who knows, perhaps the graphene revolution is just around the corner. Thank you. Thank you, Anthea. Um, are there any safety issues around graphene? Um, no. Yes and no. So first of all, graphene, as I said, is just carbon. Mm. Um, the only issue would be that 
since it's a nanomaterial, our bodies, for example, might not know exactly what to do with it. They, um, our body might, might not sense that there is graphene, so it cannot produce antibodies or, so or something. Um, however, in drug delivery, it might be actually good to at attach drugs to it, for example, and it might actually work. Why do you think, if it's been under our nose for such a long time, why do you think it took such a long time to discover how wonderful it was? Very good question. Um, the main reason is that te technology to see it. So since it's a, just a one atom thick material, um, obviously you cannot see it with your own eyes, and you cannot even see it with normal electron microscopes, for example. So you really, really need specialized equipment um, to be able to find it amongst the graphite flakes, so the thicker normal graphite. So that was the main reason. And also physicists didn't actually um, believe that it could exist since it's just a two-dimensional material. They actually believe that it cannot be. Uh, I like your conviction that, gra uh, that, that, that graphene is, 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 is just the same as a diamond. It conjured up a picture of somebody offering an engagement ring with a piece of lead in the, in the stone. But what's your prediction for the first public use that we will get? What's your prediction for what graphene will deliver? Um, I think most of the research is currently on electronics. So as I said, they're all already using it in flexible electronics, flexible smartphones, tablets. So that's a very promising Thank application. You. Super. Okay, Graphene is a girl's best friend. <laughs> She's from Malta. She did not falter. Give it up for Anthea, Aegeus, Anastasi. And you see, Zaid, you can mess up the stage and tidy it up afterwards as well. That's possible as well. One little thing about the story about Graphene, by the way, as you may know, is that the guy who co shared in the Nobel Prize for it, Andre Geim, uh, ten years earlier than that, he won an Ig Nobel Prize, which is given to kind of crazy research for levitating frogs. So if you're the kind of kid who messes around in a laboratory, it doesn't mean you're not going to be the one who ends up with a Nobel Prize as well. Now, I've said more than once that we've got 10 Tremi finalists representing 11 countries, but for the pedants among you, and this being a Cheltenham Science Festival audience, there will be plenty of those here today, I need to make a small correction. We've got 10 Tremi finalists representing 10 countries and one autonomous special administrative region of the People's Republic of China namely Hong Kong. <laughs> and that special administrative region is represented by Nicole Phoebe Tanner. Uh, Nicole is a... F wait. wait. Uh, Nicole is a fourth-year medical student at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. She says that medicine isn't just about treating diseases, but about preventing them taking place through better communication and education. And she sees FameLab as helping her be a better communicator and therefore a better doctor. Now, I wouldn't normally tell you that Nicole Phoebe Tanner is an anagram of enable nicer poo then, but given that Nicole won the Hong Kong final dressed as a poo, it does seem worth sharing. I don't think she's going to be any species of feces today, but just in case, put your hands together and then wash them carefully for Nicole Phoebe Tanner. <laughs> time to tell you about this deadly disease and why vaccines are so important. Look at my beautiful face. Take a look. I have smallpox all over. Smallpox is caused by the variola virus. It's usually transmitted through inhalation of the virus. Once it's inhaled, the virus replicates in the respiratory tract. It gets into the blood and is carried all over the body to different organs. When it attacks skin cells, it causes rashes and blisters to form all over your body. It wasn't until 1796 when a doctor called Edward Jenner from England made an interesting observation. He noticed that milkmaids had previously contracted cowpox, a far less dangerous version of the smallpox virus, were generally immune to smallpox. So he came up with this hypothesis that there was something protective about cowpox. And so he took his gardener's son, James, and inoculated him with cowpox from a milkmaid's blister. And it worked! But imagine that conversation. <clears throat> Thanks for trimming the grass today. Mind if I borrow your son to inoculate a potentially deadly virus? Eh, uh, sure. Which one? James or Harry? Uh, James will do, thank you. 
And that is literally how the world's first vaccine began. Now, to understand how vaccines work, we need to first understand how our immune system defends us from disease. When a foreign microbe invades, our immune system tries to recognize it and remove it from our body. Adaptive immunity is the part of our immune system that recognizes and creates memories of microbes. It's kind of like when you go on a bad date. You just don't forget what they look like, am I right? <laughs> This memory allows our immune system to respond quickly when the same virus attacks again. Kind of like when you see your date at the supermarket and your body instinctively does this little walk away, walk away, walk away. <laughs> Similarly, our immune system recognizes its bad dates and responds immediately. However, there is still a risk because our body takes time to develop these responses. And that's where vaccines come in. Vaccines are inactivated or killed microorganisms. They trick the body into believing that the virus is attacking, which triggers the adaptive immunity to develop. The next time the real virus attacks, our immune system can quickly fight it off. You see, Edward Jenner's experiment, his development of the world's first vaccine, was a big step toward preventing many other diseases from killing millions of people in the past. So I beg of you, everyone in 2017, to help me. Help me keep vaccines around and help me get rid of this makeup. I mean, smallpox. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you've convinced me how important vaccines are, mm -hmm. but why do you think in 2017, why do you think people need convincing? So why in the future might people be wanting to get rid of vaccines? Why do we need to stop them, that message? Yeah, that's very interesting because um, while it's not really a controversy within the scientific community, it's very much still a controversy outside. There's still a group of people we call anti-vaxxers who refuse to get vaccines based on some beliefs. For example, um, it's links to autism or that vaccines are very, you know, they're poison, giving your children poison, it's not good. And so I think it's very important that we address those beliefs and we address this group of people so we don't bring back very, very dangerous diseases that can, you know, come and kill many people. For example, in the US, actually measles has increased three times this year. And that is actually supposedly one of the diseases we can very much eradicate with vaccination. So it's very important that we use science communication. We use talking to each other, conversations, to convince more people to be on this amazing movement that can cure many diseases. And uh, are we still developing new vaccines? Has Jenna's work come to an end, or, or wh wh where are we going with vaccination? Well, that's a very interesting question as well. You see, that's why I'm so interested in vaccinations, because I think that it's something that is very multidimensional. You know, in the past, it's got a very rich history from Edward Jenner, even before Edward Jenner. There were a lot of kind of different hypotheses and way of testing. Um, and in the future, there's still so many uh, ways to develop it in the future. Uh, for example, we want to tackle, I'm sorry, I'm shedding a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so in some way, uh, we can develop uh, more vaccines to tackle more illnesses so more viruses can be prevented, especially those that cause chronic diseases, for example, HIV. The vaccine has sort of been developed, but it's not, very, it's not tested, not um, approved for human beings yet. And on top of that, I, I know you just, yeah. One yep, yeah. No. Um, I just want to add one point. I also think Quickly. it's very important <laughs> that we consider um, other countries in the world that don't have access to vaccinations. How can we make it accessible for them? How can we make it cheaper or um, make uh, give them the the knowledge of vaccination so that they can prevent these diseases in their country thank, thank you, you very much okay thank smallpox you. big generous applause for nicole phoebe tanner jenna us oh never mind okay now we've got pebbles and postulants on the stage it's getting out of control here so was that her hong kong swan song or will she be back for the final we will know soon enough that was finalist number six we are more than halfway in this first tremi final and next we go to someone from somewhere a mere 2,978 times bigger than Hong Kong and with 180 times the population, India, Fame Lab, come for the talent, stay for the stats. Uh, our Indian champion, Maya Bonkil, is a researcher at the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai, or Bombay, some say, looking at stress and strain in lithium-ion batteries. I didn't even know batteries suffered from stress. When not assaulting batteries, Maya loves theatre, drama, music, and in particular, reading mythological books, which I assume means books about mythology rather than books which may or may not be real. 
Uh, you've only got three minutes in Fame Lab, so no time for the Mahabharata, only for what matters as we get some supercharged science from Mayor Bonkiel. <laughs> As my flight was about to land at India's seventh biggest international airport, I was surprised by the shining array of reflective panels. A green welcome to Cochin International Airport, India, which is the first airport in the world that completely operates on solar power. This airport can produce as much energy as it consumes, absolutely power neutral. And credit goes to sand. Confused? Curious. Let me explain. The most common constituent of sand is silicon, which is used in solar cells to generate electricity from sunlight. Silicon has dual personality, some properties of metal, some of non-metal. We call such elements as semiconductors. Some impurities are introduced into semiconductors to modify their conductivity. This process is known as doping. Here, doping is illegal. Due to added impurity, one side becomes positively charged and other negatively charged. This is known as P and junction. But how the magical transformation of sunlight to electricity happens? This was explained by Einstein, who described light as composed of photons rather than continuous waves. The property of absorbing photons of light and releasing electrons is known as photoelectric effect. When a photon with a sufficient energy strikes the solar cell, electron absorbs the energy and becomes free. If electrical conductor is attached to the positive and negative sides, these free electrons can be captured in the form of direct current, that is electricity. Solar cells electrically connected to each other form a solar panel. Cochin Airport has installed 46,150 such panel in an area as large as 25 football fields. This 12 megawatt solar photovoltaic plant supply electricity for all the operational function of the airport. However, while waiting for my next flight, I thought that energy production only takes place when sun is shining. What about the night? So this is a grid connected system. The surplus energy produced in the afternoon is sent to the main grid and drawn back at night. Over the next 25 years, this green power project will avoid 3 lakh metric tons of carbon dioxide emission, which is equivalent to drive a fossil fuel burning car 94,000 times around the Earth. Friends, on Earth's surface, we get approximately 10,000 times more energy than what we use. Hence, with a better and cheaper solar technology, let's create a bright future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're, we're always imagining, or we always seem to think that, that solar energy is just a good thing. And what I never hear is what are the downsides? Are there any costs to it which we which sweep under the carpet and we don't discuss. Uh, how much energy is involved in producing the, the, the silicon and the, and the solar panels? Or is it really just all a good thing? Yeah, the energy involved in overall production is definitely, the, the CO2 emission, if you consider, is definitely less than the saving that we will make once the panels are ready and installed. So this is the downside. Second one, we can say, the area that is required. But in this Cochin International Airport, they set up the plant in the area which is re uh, reserved for the future expansion. So once that the building is with there, the whole plant will be shifted on the rooftop. So, yeah. so this is second downstair. So energy, space, and then we can say cost is also one of the downside. But the life is 25 years, and payback period is five years. Right. And I have a question which is related to Jamie's on the... Uh, on vaccinations, we still seem to need convincing that solar energy is worth putting into our buildings. So we're still putting in huge, bu we're building huge buildings in our cities without a single solar panel in them. So what, what, is, what do you think is stopping us from embracing it in all its potential? Uh, the efficiency of the solar cell. Mm. Currently, the efficiency is very less, some 20 to 40%. So that's why we required a huge area. 
So the research is going on. The scientists are coming with a new material with a better efficiency. Imagine in the future we have this much solar cell that can power the entire building. That can be the great future. So the, the, what is stopping us is the efficiency. Mm -hmm. so we require a huge land for that. Thank you. Okay. Very sure one. Um, yeah. One <laughs> thing that will improve the efficiency. One thing that will improve the efficiency, the material. Can we have a natural material, such as some bacteria or some algae, or something from the fruit that we extracted to prepare the solar cell material? Definitely that can be improved the efficiency. Have you thought of graphene? Apparently it does everything. OK. <laughs> can we tap into the power of applause, please, for our Indian champion, Mayor Bonkeel? And Mayor Bonkeel is probably my favourite anagram of this first Tremi final, which is monkey burial. Uh, in at seven, we have Artur Sordobiev, our current champion from the world's largest landlocked country, which is, of course, Kazakhstan, you see. You can tell this is a Cheltenham audience. That's excellent, yeah. Now, I've never been there, but I'm off next month and back in August to host some energy conferences there, so I'm very excited about it. Uh, Arta is from Shimkent, which is in the deep south of the country, but is now an instructor of robotics at Nazarbayev University in the capital, Astana, a journey he managed to make via Dublin, where he earned a BSc in computing, and my old department in Edinburgh, where he got a master's in informatics. Like me, Art has studied artificial intelligence. Unlike me, he's still doing something useful with it. Like me, Art has made it to the first Tremi final of International Fame Lab. Unlike me, he's earned his place here. So give a big Kazakh standing ovation to Art Sordobiev. <laughs> ago, I took a plastic tube, I spit into it, and posted it. Uh, for a genetic test, of course. Soon I obtained a bunch of health reports, and one of them stated that I might lose my central vision with age. And uh, preventively, I should quit smoking, I should uh, carry a healthy lifestyle, and control my alcohol consumption. Yeah, right, I said. <laughs> but also nervously checked on my watch that I was 26 years old at the time. And it kept me thinking, how is this information obtained? And how significant is it to my life? DNA carries g genetic information for living organisms. It consists of long sequences of four nucleotides, which we refer to using letters A, T, C, and G. The uh, functional regions of this ATCG code are, call are called genes, and they are used as blueprints for production of proteins, which are essential units enabling all biological processes in our bodies. But naturally, variations occur in this ATCG code. Say, if in most people, in a specific location, a letter A can be found, well, in others, uh, nucleotide C might occupy the same exact position. And it's crucial to understand that change in the code means change in the output. If you were to change letter D, uh, uh, letter C in the word cool with letter P, you get a completely different word. And similarly, a completely different protein might get produced in a cell and hence different biological function, for example, immune system response. But how do we find out if the variation is negative, if it is menacing? Well, one common approach is through what's called genome-wide association studies. People get divided into those with the disease and without. Scientists then rapidly scan their genomes for known variants, and if a variation occurs more often than expected in people with disease, then likely seeing this variation in new people means they have genetic predisposition for the condition. It is an incredibly empowering instrument for detection, prevention, and treatment. And people, for the first time in history, have truly the opportunity to live proactively. I got my insights, and it got me a little bit conscious of what I'm eating. I started exercising. I quit smoking, like, multiple times. And in the span of two years, I lost around 20 kilograms. I do feel healthier, and maybe, maybe, I do get to keep my central vision when I'm 90. Also, best of luck to myself making it till 90. But science does give me this invaluable hints on what to do today and tomorrow to live a better life. And for it, I am genuinely grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. These variations in the genes, what, what 
uh, type of functions have they found um, that diseased, uh, the diseased um, people have? What type of um, functions in the disease do these genetic variations um, cause? It's a very good question. There might be numerous of those. Um, uh, these changes might not affect only disease, it can af affect phenotype, but it's basically a very complex uh, process. Say, uh, the change in the letter might tweak a protein, or, a, 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 or multiple repetitive proteins might get produced, which shouldn't be, and it creates the abnormality in the cell. So um, it underlies, for example, sickle cell anemia, where a, a, a protein uh, which should be produced in the cell uh, fails to perform its function, and it causes, it, it, it triggers the disease. So uh, the truth is, it can be a number of things uh, for how this can uh, get imp it, the impact, negative impact on the disease. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can you give any example maybe of where um, understanding these variations has led to um, development of treatments? Yes, um, for uh, mm, the best, the most common way today is to see how people with different variations respond to drugs. And it's the first big way to uh, precision medicine uh, because uh, we do respond very differently to drugs and it uh, uh, creates this, reduces the efficiency sometimes when we're all treated the same. Uh, so in terms of disease, for example, not, not in the way directly, for my case with age-related macular degeneration, what my case is called, it's not treatable. I can only prevent it by doing the right things. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, treating common disease, complex disease, chronic diseases, I can get uh, more effective, more efficient drugs and treatment, which, which is custom to myself. Thank you. Um, so you, um, <laughs> You discovered your, your eyesight might fade and you combated that with, with diet. So if genes are telling you one thing, how is changing something like diet helping? Because that directly uh, affects my, the environment, the cellular environment in my body. And I do get the nutrients. I don't get destructive effect of smoking and, or alcohol, for example. And it's a, it's a very complicated system. Uh, the genetic basis is there, the <coughs> chemical environment is there, and the interaction between those elements, the intoxication is there. So if I, if I fix what I can fix, likely I might be well off at the end. Okay, once more for our gent from Shimkentkin, star from Astana, Artur Sordobiev. Now this next one I've met before because I did the masterclass for Fame Lab in France and I had a feeling our paths might be crossing again. Uh, Arnold Oswald has been bouncing around between Paris and Montreal, getting a double degree in engineering and working on biosourced composite materials. What Arnold gets really excited about though, even more than biosourced composite materials, is the place of science in society and the place of our Earth in the cosmos. He says he's got an unconditional love for space and that FameLab is his way of helping him directly share this love and his other scientific passions with the rest of us. He's not been to the moon yet, but he's going to try and take us there. Please make a French connection with Arnold Oswald. <laughs> night in autumn 1609 a man aims at the sky his brand new telescope and for the first time a human being sees mountain on the moon now a few centuries later another man walks around and gazes at the sky but this time that's the earth he sees you see in 1969 a human being is walking on the moon three and a half centuries separate Galileo from Apollo 11 that makes up for about 15 generations just such a huge change in perspective in such a small amount of time. What happened? The spreading of the scientific method. Yes, we're going to talk about the scientific method. Now, some of you might be disappointed. Or, oh, space exploration got me excited, but then it shifted on a boring subject. <laughs> but it's true, I get it. It's scientific method sounds a bit cold in our collective imaginations. When I was younger, I thought it was about serious people in white coats following blindly a rigid protocol. And that's exactly why I'm inviting you right now to put aside your biases and see it with new eyes. So what is exactly this magic recipe? Well, everything begins with an idea. You know that subject that intrigues you? You already have an opinion on it. Well, you can write it down somewhere, make a kind of gamble, a prediction. That's an hypothesis. Keep it for later. Now for the surprising part. 
You're not looking for evidence that your ID is valid. No, 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 no. You're looking for evidence that your ID is wrong. Not really intuitive, so what's the plan? Well, test. Test your ID. Test its opposite. Test your instruments. They might be broken. In short, experiment. And then you take a step back and put on your detective coat. That's the analysis. You have to classify the clues, put aside false testimonies, and finally, you can compare your predictions and the observation. And that's the best part, because either you were wrong, but you learned something new along the way, or you're right, and your ID stays valid. Well, to be precise, it stays valid up to the point where you or someone else finds a flaw in it. And there it is, the magic recipe that took us to the moon, a method that systematically questions what it produces. Why would I be wrong instead of why would I be right? Now, as you heard, there's no need to talk about eight-dimensional vector space. Despite its name, the scientific method isn't reserved to scientists. So here is the take-home message. The scientific method is just a way of thinking, an adventurous guide to see things more clearly. There was a time where it did not exist, and there was a time where it wasn't accessible to everybody. But today, neither are true, and I think this is as marvelous as your human working on the moon. Thank you. So if we're convinced scientific method in the lab, definitely important. Should the scientific method bleed out into our everyday life? Do you think we, we see the world in a scientific way? Yeah, definitely. Because um, about the, the core principles of the scientific method, which is like being curious and being skeptical. It's basically, I mean, kids are wired to do the scientific method. They push things, oh, it breaks. Okay, so that's how it works. And then they put things in their mouth and, you know. So about the core principles, yes, definitely. We, we could use it everywhere. But you could say, yeah, of, of course, when it gets to the very high level statistical criteria, you're not going to use it when you make a painting. So, <laughs> but yeah, um, I definitely think we have to think about how we can use it in our society. Yeah, in daily lives. So are, are we natural scientists? Are we... Definitely. That's my opinion, but definitely. <laughs> that would seem to contradict evolution, which makes us look for things that prove us right so that we can tell stories. And your story ah, made yeah. me think of William Herschel, one of our most important astronomers, who through his telescope saw life on the moon, and he saw trees, and he saw villages, and he wrote a book about it. Ah, and yet okay. he was one of our greatest astronomers. So how do you square the human dreamer uh, and storyteller with scientific method being natural? Well, I think you need both, because in order to discover something, you have to be creative. So you have, you have to get to this place where you see things that really aren't there in order to make new hypotheses. But you also have to take into account that you might be wrong. So yeah, that's, you, you need both. So uh, science is all about being creative and at the same time looking at what you do with a, an objective mindset. So uh, you. you need both. I, yeah. Thank you. Okay, one small step for a man, one giant leap for a fame labber. Our scientific methodical fame lab, France 2017 winner, Arnold Oswald. Now, last but one in this first Tremi final, which sounds impressive until you realise we're still less than a third of the way through all 31 of them. We come to the country that's first but one in the current fame lab, Alphabet Azerbaijan. Uh, their 2017 final was won by Bakhtiar Mamadli, a third-year physics student at Baku Engineering University. Now, Bakhtiar isn't one of those all chalk and blackboards and equations type physicists, more at home with complex theories than anything practical. He's an inventor, and he's behind lots and lots of inventions. Although he does have a slightly loftier long-term goal, he says, my main goal is to win the Nobel Prize in physics. First, though, he'll settle for winning FameLab International, and to do that, he has to make it to the final. Strap in and prepare to go Baku to the future with our man from Azerbaijan, Bakhtiar Mamadli. <laughs> Today, I will talk about the physics in our daily life. Firstly, I want to give a question. Do you like football? Who likes football? Yeah, I see lots of people like football. Yeah, 
We can see the physics in the football. How? Now I will show it. Suppose that I kick the ball to the forward, and ball moves forward, turning counterclockwise. So what it happens in this time? On the right side of the ball, A stream moves backward with the opposite direction of turning of ball. So on the right side, speed decreases. But on the left side, A stream moves backward with the same direction of turning of ball. So on the left side, speed uh, increases. We know from physics, where we have less speed, we have more pressure. Where we have more speed, we have less pressure. So on the right side of the ball, we have less speed, so we have more pressure. So the ball moves to the left side. Actually, we can see Roberto Carlos is master in this. Actually, A moves around us like this. Um, A moves place where there is more pressure to the place where there is less pressure and makes equal everywhere. We can observe this on uh, air balloons. There is some object like uh, helium balloons or hot air balloons which can float over the air because these objects have less average density than air. Also, the gravity causes the air pressure to increase with the distance in the downward direction. So, at the bottom of the helium balloons, there is more pressure than top of the helium balloons. So, the force exerts uh, bottom from the top, and helium balloons can fly. Actually, airplanes fly like this. When a, the airplane is flying, there is less speed bottom of the wings than top of the wings. So there is more pressure bottom of the wings than top of the wings. So uh, it helps that airplanes fly. Oh, sorry. Actually, we can observe these principles in our motivation. For example, you have target, and you work hard and speedy on your target. Then you feel less pressure on you. But when you say that, no, I cannot do it, you don't believe yourself, then you decrease your speed, thus you increase the pressure on you. Finally, I want to mention that don't pay attention to pressure confronting you and work, high, work, and work hard on your targets with high speed. At the end of my presentation, I have a small gift for audience. Now, I will throw the ball to the audience and who will catch the ball from audience? Ball will be uh, the gift from me to that person. Now, are you ready for my gift? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, th that was very ordinary. We hear that on, on football television programs all the time. The pundits are always telling us about where the air is on the ball. Um, when, uh, can, can we use this information? I, I work with football players. Can we actually help them to train better by understanding the physics of a football? Or do you think it's best that we leave them to be the natural physicists that they are? Uh, actually, physics allows we can see uh, every part of our life. Football, these prin principles actually work on not just football, baseball, <laughs> other sports. But uh, I mentioned that the main things that the physics laws don't, don't just work on our physical life. Just uh, we can observe these principles in our mor morality, in our motivation. For example, another example, when the objects fall down, the, the gravity force uh, attract the object to the earth. Also, when we think good, the gravity, uh, I think, attract the good things to us, and we feel good, good, we feel good. But when we think bad, uh, we feel uh, bad, so the with the attraction. So you actually, what you're telling us is that you actually do see the whole of your life through physics. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, where did you come <laughs> up with the examples you wanted to use? So you knew you wanted to talk about uh, physics of everyday life and about pressure. Why did you come up with the idea about showing us the balloon and showing us the football? Uh, b because uh, the, um, how can I say? Can you, uh, you repeat your question? Sure. I cannot. Why tell us about football? Why use that as an example? Because uh, the s uh, uh, all of the examples, uh, the principles same. Uh, high pressure. When we have high pressure. Uh, we have low speed. When we have more pressure, we have a high speed. And actually, these principles uh, which uh, we can observe uh, everywhere. For example, the flight of uh, airplane, I show that 
when the uh, airplane flying, there is more, uh, there is less speed bottom of the wings, so there is more pressure. So I show it, uh, my little plane. And one well, more question from me. You say you're a football fan. Who is your favorite team? Um, my favorite team is Real Madrid. Wrong answer. Okay, once more for our Azerbaijan <laughs> champion, back to you, Mamadli. Now, Mamadli didn't do badly, but did he do well enough to get through to the final? We will find out soon enough as we're about to have our final semi finalist in this first tremi final. And it is our boy from Brazil, Felipe Lima da Costa. Felipe likes beer and movies and riding his bike on sunny days. Me too. And he considers himself to be a specialist on internet memes. Me, not so much. But what he actually studies at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul is something rather more concrete. It's cement and the chemistry of how it's formed. Now, unlike cement, there are no hard and fast rules to winning FameLab. But Felipe says one of his life's goals is to show that scientists can be cool too, that they're normal people, and he's got three minutes to achieve it now. So get ready for some Brazilian brilliance from our brilliant Felipe Lima da Costa. <laughs> Life is made of choices. Look at me, for example. Before coming here, I had to make a choice. Should I drive my Jaguar to the festival or should I ride my bike? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. Of course, I would drive my Jaguar if I had one. But since I don't, I took my bike. Anyway, my point is, imagine you just wake up and then you look out the window and you see this huge traffic jam. Would you choose to drive your car to go to work or would you choose to ride your bike? Well, there are many reasons why you should choose your bike. You can say it's um, cheaper, more sustainable, and you're probably going to arrive earlier with it. In this situation, the usual way to go to work, the car, is not the best choice. And we can also apply this to uh, many other things, like the material concrete. You know, the material that we use in constructions. Well, we consume lots of concrete, even more than pines here in the UK. And actually, after the water, concrete is the single most widely used material in the whole planet. And it's made of four basic ingredients, which are sand, stones, water, and cement. But there's a very concerning side about cement production. In order to produce one ton of cement, 800 kilograms of CO2 are generated and emitted to the atmosphere. That's a lot. It's equivalent to 3,000 diesel power double deckers in an all day running in a city like London. Today, cement production accounts for 8% of the total of CO2 emission in the whole planet. And by the year of 2050, it may be responsible for even 25% or a quarter of all emissions. So what's the solution for that? Well, a great part of the energy that we consume here in Europe comes from thermoelectric power plants. Those plants burn coal in order to generate electricity, but they also produce lots of waste in form of ashes. Well, I will show you that we can use those ashes to solve these problems in a very easy way, actually. All we got to do is mix this very alkaline solution of water and, calcium, uh, and caustic soda with this ash. And the result will be a material very resistant and very strong, very similar to concrete. Yes, I always bring such materials with me, and that's how I win girls' hearts. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, the result will be this material here called geopolymer, and it's very similar to concrete, except it does not generate as much pollution. And apart from ashes from thermoelectrical power plants, geopolymer can also be made from other kinds of waste, such as agroindustrials and urban waste, like the ones we throw at dumping grounds. And besides being a sustainable use for a lot of those residues, geopolymer can really make the difference in the life of unprivileged people, such as those living in slums in my country, Brazil. Developing countries could use, such, could use residues to build the same things that are normally made with concrete, such as sidewalks, sewage systems, and even houses, but with a much more affordable cost. Life is made of choices, and since we're talking about geopolymer, we can say it may be cheaper and definitely more sustainable. The usual way is not always the best choice. The concrete is not always the best choice. Sometimes we should choose to take the bike. Thank you. Oh, by the way, by the way, I have some samples of geopolymer if you want to take a look. Please help me, guys. Yeah? <laughs> All right. Thank you. So thank you. You're selling us an alternative. So why, why is it not being used at the moment as much? Um, that's a very good question. Thank you for it. Um, actually, I, I, want to I would say that it's a very similar to what's happening to electric cars, what has happened. I mean, electric cars have always existed, but the cars moved by gasoline were always more popular by many reasons. 
So we, what we can see right now is kind of, kind of a transition. But the main reason is, uh, nowadays we don't have standards for geopolymer. We have for concrete, but we don't have for geopolymer. But as time passes by, those kind of standards are going to appear, and this material is going to be uh, used more and more, of course. And you guys are going to hear about it in the future. So there's always pros and cons to anything. What are the cons to this? Of course, so. other nice question. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I, as I said, it's made of different residues, right? So for each different residue, we have a different chemical composition and have different characteristics. So for every different residue, we have to make a different solution, alkaline solution. So in, uh, you can't not simply take one residue and mix with an alkaline solution. It's not like that. You, have to, you need to have some specialized assistance to do that. So it's not like the people in, my, in the slums community in my country, Brazil, will be able to do it by themselves. They will need some help, specialized help. That was one of the main things why it's many of the cons, many important cons. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Seeing that they use different residues, so it, would it depend where in the world it was made and what the source material was? So will each kind of polymer be unique to that area? Exactly, exactly this. We can, and the, and the, the list of residues that can be used are really wide. You can use urban waste, like I said. You can use agro-industrial waste, like uh, rice husk ash, um, um, anyway, many different kinds of agroindustrial, and we have even some other kinds of ways, I mean, a lot of really wide things. Okay, right. finally we have found somebody who speaks faster than I do, our Brazilian 2017 Fame Lab winner, Thank Felipe you. Lima da Costa. Thank you. And I also like the fact that for all the time we've been doing Fame Lab, you're limited to whatever props you can carry on yourself, so he brought a rucksack, very clever as well. Uh, well, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, this is, we're nearly at the point where we lay this first semi-final to rest. It would be lovely if we could just leave it there and just say all ten weren't just great, they were fame labulous. But unfortunately, we do have to eliminate 70% of them. But before we do, first, can we give all ten a richly deserved round of applause, please? <laughs> I really do feel for our judges. We have seen some brilliant performances, and it's going to be inevitably cruel. Some really great ones cannot make it to the final. That's just the way it goes. So, judges, you'll need to do this really quickly. The schedule is tighter than my trousers. So can we please send Joanne Riley, Vin Walsh, Jamie Gallagher, hustle, huddle, tussle, struggle, but do it in 10 minutes and be back here. Send them on their way with some applause, please. So the judges are ready, axes have been wielded, decisions have been reached, deductions about reductions have been made. Let's get them back on stage. Round of applause, please, as they come back. <laughs> Jamie and Joanne and Vin. And there isn't room to squeeze everybody on the stage, but can we have one more round of applause, please, for all of them? Representing Malaysia, Zaid Amar, Qatar champ, Yumna Musa. Our Chinese, Canadian, and currently Estonian, Latvian, De Liang Young. Daughter of Malta, Anthea Agius Anastasi. From Hong Kong, Nicole Phoebe Turner. Indian champion, Mayor Bonkiel. Kazakhstan champ, Artur Sordabiev. In with a chance from France, Arnold Oswald. Uh, and after Arnie comes to Azerbaijani, back to Mamadli. And last, but statistically unlikely to be least, our boy from Brazil, Felipe Lima da Costa. Thank you. Okay, so we've got two other Tremi finals to get to, so we will get straight to it. Judges, you can't say all the names at once because this is a sort of simultaneous thing. So they have to come out in an order, but let's be clear, these are three equal ones. First of all, the traditional question, and I know it's very true here, that must have been tough. It was. It, it was. We, it was tough even coming up with our, our own kind of three winners, and then we, we came together and kind of argued over them all. Um, I think there was a, a huge mix of talent in there, very different communication styles. Fantastic. A huge mix, but not a huge range, because it was all very, very, very talented. I mean, I, I, I genuinely think if this had been the final, we'd be really, really happy. Yeah. Okay, so, sorry kids, get ready for joy and disappointment on a three to seven ratio. <laughs> okay. Um, names or, or feedback? Do you want Oh, you can give a little bit of you. Oh, yeah, if you've got a few little general thoughts, that's fantastic. I, I just thought we might just say just a couple of minutes what we, what we I saw. I think that would be appreciated. 
Yeah, yeah no, I mean, I, I really want to congratulate everybody today. Uh, I think, as you said, the standard was excellent. The messages that were coming across were clear, um, particularly those that were speaking um, not in their first language. There was no problem with not understanding. Um, I think you handled yourself so well and didn't even see any nerves. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think what I saw today was uh, evidence of, of a, a, a whole new generation and style of scientific communication. When I started off doing this kind of thing, it was about tell, just telling people about science. But what really impressed me about, uh, about these presentations today is that they were all contextualized within our everyday lives about things that matter. And I think that's the real key to good science communication is not whether it's true uh, or just or, or living the science on its own, but putting it in the context of everyday life. Because now that we've got the internet and everybody can look up uh, uh, scientific facts, the question for us scientists is, what can we tell people that they can't look up on Google? And that's the that's that's the skill of contextualising it and 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 bringing people in to be citizen scientists. Were, they, were they so good, you think you're going to have to sharpen your own act or maybe become a Simon Cowell impersonator full time? <laughs> Whichever pays the most, I have my price. Simon Cowell impersonator, <laughs> I'd probably bet. Jamie? Yeah, uh, there was um, demonstrations, visualizations, analogies that I hadn't thought of, hadn't seen before. They were creative, informative. A lot of time and effort had been put into the presentations, every single one of them, and it was really clear to see that. But we did have to pick three. Yep. So, and again, in, in no particular order, the, the three people that we decided to put through. Um, and, first when you, when they, and when you say your name, please come up on the stage and bask in some richly deserved applause. So we have Anthea, Aguirre, Anastasi from Malta. <laughs> also, Nicole Tanner from Hong Kong. <laughs> And Mayer Bonkil from India. Woo! Wow, that is it. Maya, Anthea, and Stasi are going to go through to the final. The others, I'm really sorry. You deserve a place, but it's just a matter of space time compression. We just can't get all of you into the final. So that is it. Can we please thank our judges, Vin Walsh, Demi Gallagher, Joanne Riley? Once again, to not just our finalists, but all 10 of our brilliant Tremi finalists. <laughs>